Hello and welcome to this weather topic video. This weather topic is going to be going over Doppler radar. First I'm going to explain how Doppler radar works and then I'm going to be mainly dissing Doppler radar going over how relatively fragile it is. Uh, before I get into anything I do want to say that Doppler is an absolute marvel of technology. It is the absolute best thing that the NWS has for storm detection and with helping them know where everything is. Doppler is the number one tool aside from human spotters for the NWS. A very very basic explanation on how Doppler works is that Doppler radar, uh, dual pulse or dual channel dual pulse Doppler radar sends out radio waves at around 300 to 500 pulses per second. Now, this is, now this works very similar to echolocation. So the pulse is so some of the pulse is sent back from a solid object, that being rain or hail inside of the storm. This is how Doppler detects things, and this is also the downfall of Doppler, if you can uh, uh, look ahead. Now, this is exactly how a TBSS, triple body scatter spike, happens. That is this little appendage, anomalous appendage right here. It's called anomalous because theoretically, this spike should never technically happen. But what's going on is that in front of it here, we are seeing some extremely high values. This value is either caused by either, in most cases, heavy hail, but it can also be caused by very uh, big rain inside of the storm. Of course, this is a loft. It has not fallen yet. And because the hail is so large, it's and hail is, you know, it's irregularly shaped, it's going to bounce some of this. I'll use the edge of this picture here as an example. It'll bounce some of this uh, sh uh, stuff off, this uh, r these radio waves off of it, and it'll send it back to the radar. Cool, good, that's what it wants. But also, what happens is that, say there's a little cut right here, that uh, shit, sorry, that shift is caused because, well, we are, seeing the Doppler radio wave being put, being sent back to the ground, off of the ground, off of the object again, and then back to the radar. So it's causing this effect where the spike is uh, occurring. Again, theoretically, this spike should never really happen, but there you go. It's weird. Doppler can also uh, detect movement based off of shift. This is called the Doppler shift, the Doppler effect. The exact same thing as the aud as the auditory effect, but this but in this case it's with wind, and I'll get to that in just a little bit. Doppler radar also scans in very small slices. If we see in the exact same image as the scatter spike, we also see the Doppler radar itself with some ground clutter here, and this hole right here is where the Doppler is. Doppler cannot detect something directly on top of itself. The beam just can't go that high. But also note how these are really, really, th this, these are a crap ton of really thin uh, particles, I'm going to call them. This, this is because, again, like I just said, the Doppler scans in slices. Doppler radar only spends seven seconds every hour sending out its radio waves. So the rest of the 59 minutes, 53 seconds, is spent listening for the return. That is an insanely long amount of time, an insanely short amount of time, only sending out. A full 360 degree scan can take, depending on the mode, if if uh, that radar needs to be going faster, there may be storms in the area. It can take around two to three minutes. A normal 360 scan is around four to five to six minutes. Doppler in its very most boiled down version is simply echolocation. 
It is obviously much more advanced than this because it can detect much more than that, but that is the very boiled down version of how Doppler radar works. A quick look at uh, reflectivities, echoes, and velocity. So there are two types of, rec of reflectivity. There is base and there's composite. And in this top image here, we are seeing both. Base reflectivity scans the lowest down. Now this can be caused because a storm might be too close to Doppler. That is most certainly possible. Usually base composite reflectivity is, base reflectivity, sorry, is done on purpose. And this is simply showing what is coming out of the storm. It is not showing what is up inside, so what the maximum values are, which is what composite reflectivity does. Composite reflectivity scans all levels of the storm and combines the highest values, showing us the golf ball size hail that is inside the storm that may only come out as marble because hail is ice. It shouldn't be freezing temperature throughout the whole atmosphere from the time it goes to the ground. Storms don't usually happen in such an environment, so that hail is going to melt. Again, it's ice. So there's that. A quick thing on echo is that because it's echolocation boiled down again, Doppler is only receiving an echo. This is the exact same thing as what happens with your voice, of course. And that is why things are called a hook echo or a bow echo. There's a little trivia for you. There is also velocity. There is, of course, base uh, velocity, but there's also storm relative velocity, which is what we are seeing in this uh, second image of this picture at the lower right. We have the composite reflectivity. This is specifically of the Joplin EF5 from May 2011. And we are seeing this very, very pronounced hook echo. It is not discrete by any means. We see it has stuff um, mostly behind it. Not sh there. It doesn't look like it doesn't appear that there's anything in front of this thing. And what storm relative velocity does that it help. Oops. It helps detect tornadoes much more than nearly any other tool. This is because with velocity, it measures. Uh, again, this is a Doppler shift type effect where that the brighter the colors are, the faster they are. For, for the knowledge part of here, red is away from the radar and green is towards the radar. And a tornado signature here, it's very visible here, is called a couplet. They are coupling together with very, very strong. The red turns into Yellow can turn into orange. The green it turns into teal, turns into blue. And that are the that is the brighter versions of red and green, as we all know. Uh, always. I mean, I've known this since I was a child. Blue is just the brighter version of green. Obviously. But that again, that, that is called a couplet. Helps detect tornadoes very well. The inherent problems that I'm going to go over, so stuff that is not imp that is that can be avoided, but is going to happen, is the angling that Doppler radar needs to have, the travel of the beam itself, and the dead zones that Doppler has. First of all, angling and height. So Doppler has to be, first of all, on a tower, as we see here in this, uh, in this image at the bottom right, but it also has to scan at an angle. This is to prevent itself, itself by, by that I mean the Doppler uh, beam pulse, from hitting any trees, any other tall buildings in the immediate area. Immediate being actually a fairly big area, but still. This is to avoid... Uh, any errors and that specifically ground clutter. Um, something that's actually pretty cool is that because uh, solid objects bounce the radar beam back, 
you can actually see migratory bird patterns or like bats migrating out of caves or out of or birds out of trees. It's actually pretty cool. Um, but that that's the cool thing of Doppler. Also, storm detection is cool too. But obviously, if this beam is going to be hitting, you know, uh, Empire State and the Chrysler Building all the time, that's not going to be okay. It's just not cool. Obviously, because the beam is reflected back from solid objects, the beam cannot go through with solid objects. This means it can also not scan that are scan storms that are sufficiently far away. If a storm is too far away, then you get into the dead zone of Doppler radar. So it just is unable to scan it because it is not able to get enough information back. Not only that, but the curvature of this of the Earth itself, quote unquote, heightens and quote the beam. Now, this is over such a relatively short distance of the Earth that it is not exactly a factor, but it is still a minor part of this issue. Uh, slight slice width with distance is also an inherent problem here. It is the exact same issue as a height, but instead it is simply horizontal. So just so it's literally just this height problem, but again horizontal instead. This means that the beam is going to lose accuracy as it goes further out. Obviously, uh, the the square ruled effect. The exact same thing with light. That's why you do not see a you see an aircraft's shadow as it goes above you is because square light rule that shadow is going to be diffused. That's the exact same thing with uh, with Doppler radar. You can see the storm out there, maybe, but you can't get the Doppler beam to reach it. Now we have the dead zones. So not only was it the dead, was it the eye that I showed you in the first um, uh, image there uh, with uh, with the triple body scatter spike, but also. Uh, the entire U.S. has uh, spots that it, that Doppler simply cannot reach as of right now. This map in the top right is a much better picture of here, and we but we also see at the bottom left that Doppler is mainly is strategically placed around high population areas. And to cover as many people as possible, Doppler radars are not just put around willy-nilly. There's a reason, there's a rhyme and reason to it, even though it may not look like it. Obviously, Doppler radar is most effective at a sufficient distance. However, this distance can, as you might expect, not be too close to the radar. The... Like I just mentioned, and is implied from what I said at the very beginning of here, Doppler cannot scan directly above itself or too far out. Stuff like the Rockies are going to inhibit uh, the Doppler radar beam coverage as well, which is why we are seeing dead zones pretty commonly around Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada. It is pronounced Nevada, fight me. And I am moving away from Nevada, which it is pronounced, and going to the unavoidable issues of Doppler radar, that being beam travel, obstacles, and refractions. Beam travel, we've already talked about, really. If it's too far out, if a storm is too far out, that means that the beam is going to be less accurate, more diffused, and the pulse, the pulse is going to be wider spread out, which means it's less likely to interact with a solid object, rain, hail and send that information back. If it is too close, again, already talked about this, that means it'll be unable to, that Doppler right, might not be able, might not be able to scan the storm entirely, sorry about my stuttering, or it might only be able to get a base reflectivity if it is still too close to it. Now, first of all, in this picture here, all praise the giant soccer ball in the sky. Secondly, obstacles. 
again, already talked about this. Doppler and its radar beam pulse, therefore, cannot go through solid objects. Other, th Because if, the, if this was the case, Doppler radar simply wouldn't work. It wouldn't detect rain and hail. It would not detect storms at all. Again, the great soccer ball in the sky must be on a tower. And this is the... <clears throat> Uh, th this is the biggest analogy that I that I like to use for Doppler, is that Doppler is like our own eyes. It can only see as long as there's nothing in front of it. I have a monitor directly in front of me. I cannot see the wall through my monitor. Now, my glasses, on the other hand, are clear, and I can see through those, but that's an exception. Doppler can't, though. I, 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 now I'm looking past, now I'm looking past my monitor, I see my wall, but I cannot see through my wall, of course, because it's my wall, you know? <laughs> Doppler is like our own eyes. There is also things called refractions with Doppler radar. There is the sub-refraction and super-refraction. There's also ducting and trapping. Surprisingly, I figured out that all of these can be caused by a temperature inversion aloft, or simply by a parcel of warm air aloft. A temperature inversion, for those that do not know, is that normally in the troposphere, the layer of air where all weather happens, the from the ground to the tropopause, it gets cooler. An inversion is where it gets, it's, or it's cooler, or it starts to get cooler, starts to get cooler, and all of a sudden it starts to get warmer. And then that warm air stops, and it starts to get cooler again. So that part where it starts to get warmer is the inversion, obviously because it is inverse of what normally happens. Now in the stratosphere, um, an inversion would actually it be getting colder in the stratos, but we are not talking about the stratosphere. We're talking about the troposphere, because that is where all weather happens, wouldn't you know? So a sub-refraction is when the beam goes higher than normal. This is seen here uh, at this bottom right image, very thankfully. I, I, was, I was very, very happy to find this image because it does a great job of showing how sub-refraction, super-refraction, and ducting can work. A sub again sub refraction means that the beam is traveling more vertical than wanted. This can be a good thing, but for the most part, you, for the most part, you just want your Doppler beam to be acting normal. You know, normal. That 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 would be great, as expected would be would be optimal. A super refraction means that the beam is traveling more horizontal. Now. Personally, I would think that they would that they would actually want to reverse these. I re just realized I put supper refraction. It's supposed to be super. That's my bad. The supper refraction, the dinner refraction. You know, I'm gonna call it from now on, from that from now on out the dinner refraction. You know, classic dinner refraction. I would, but I guess uh, if we're talking about wanting to go more horizontal, then I guess it would be correct to be super. But I'm thinking more vertical would be super and more horizontal would be sub, but whatever. Now trapping, as you can, or ducting, either one, uh, causes the beam to have a shorter range than normal, as is seen here. So what happens is that it hits it at an at a not good angle, and bounces off this warm air, which is a little weird to have happen. This is a vast, vast um, oversimplification of how sub and super refraction and ducting works. This is a whole vast under explanation on how Doppler works. I am dumbing it down not only for the purposes of being able to explain it to everyone here, but also for myself. I am not a meteorologist, at least not yet, I hope. And I do not, and I do not understand Doppler radar in its fullest. I am dumbing it down for myself here. 
I promise you. <laughs> that's why I use the phrase Doppler is like our own eyes, because that's one of the best and simplest ways to explain Doppler radar. And with that, I have completely destroyed and dissed radar. Doppler radar should never be used. Dual shift, regular stuff is crap, right? No. <laughs> like I said at the beginning, Doppler radar is an absolute marvel of technology. By no means do I want you to think that the NWS is using a completely stupid and inferior uh, piece of technology because Doppler radar is an absolute marvel and has been optimized very, very well. The issues that I talked about in this video are just problems that happen. Of course they're going to happen. Everything has a weakness. And even well-optimized things like Doppler has them. And that's why I really wanted to talk about it. Because what the positives of Doppler are... Thumbs up. It's good. It's good, y'all. It's good. And that's really about it. But there's a lot more to talk about with the negatives of it. So again, that is all that I have for this weather topic video, y'all. I hope that y'all enjoyed. I hope that y'all learned something. And remember... Doppler is like our own eyes.